Hello, welcome back. And we are back with a great session again. Very interesting session. I keep saying that throughout the day. I've been saying that and yesterday too, but what to do? They all are such fantastic sessions. And this session is um, the future of animal protection in Asia, different approaches. And the moderator for this session is Shweta Kavishwar, who is the senior manager campaigns at FEAPO. So I'll just give a brief introduction to Shweta and um, uh, then Shweta will take over with her speak, uh, take it forward with her speaker. So Shweta comes with more than 16 years of experience in aviation, education and skill development. For the last 11 years, she has worked for upliftment of underprivileged youth in rural and urban cities of the country and towards generation of livelihood for women in semi-urban settings. In her previous roles, she has managed associations with various ministries and government departments. She has also led the partnerships with strategic international funders. As a senior manager campaigns, her role with FIAPO encompasses all the programs under vegan advocacy and outreach. Shweta, over to you. Please take it forward with your wonderful set of speakers. Uh, thank you so much for your kind words and the great introduction. Thank you. I am honored to be a part of this wonderful panel today. So moving forward, our first speaker is Maho Vihara, who has worked with the Humane League to engage with corporations and producers in Japan to implement cage-free policies. Maho studied animal advocacy and policies at Humane Society University graduate program and has worked as an animal protection advocate for two decades. In her presentation, she will address how the Humane League has worked in Japan to deal with the challenges concerning cage-free policies. Over to you. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share our work for Lay Our Hands in Japan. My name is Maho Uehara. I work for the Humane League and its Japan operation, the Humane League Japan. The Humane League's mission is to end the abuse of animals raised for food. The Humane League Japan shares the same mission, but our work in Japan focuses on layer hands. In the majority of the world, including Japan, layer hens are kept in caged confinements known as battery or enriched cages. In Japan, on average, over 140 million hens are raised for egg production. Our mission is to remove all the cages from the egg production in Japan. In Japan, it is not effective to use aggressive campaigns, so in order to achieve the mission, we bring changes through dialogues. So we meet with large corporations that purchase large amount of eggs and ask them to purchase only cage-free eggs, then publicly announce that they are using cage-free eggs. This is a battery cage. EU banned the battery cage in 2012 as its This is a battery cage. EU banned the battery cage in 2012 as it's too cruel. In the United States, several states have already banned the cages and sale of eggs came from caged production. There's no more space than a B5 pay paper size for a hen to live. They can't spread their wings. They, they are only given food and water. No chance to get natural sun or get exercise that are needed to keep their health and high immunity. Parches are necessary for layer hens, but they are not provided in the battery cages. This is an enriched cage system. Since EU banned the battery cage in 2012, um, then they have moved to the enriched cage. The Japanese egg industry and the government say that enriched cages are the future for the egg production in Japan. The enriched cage was meant to be a step up and in some ways there is a degree of improvement but as you can see there are not much space and privacy provided to the birds. THL does not accept the enriched cages and we are asking companies to totally move away from caged confinement. We think that the system like this called the aviary system is acceptable 
the system can still keep the volume production and it can provide better welfare for layer hands. At least they are not in cages. The system can be in a barn or it's ideal if the system has an extended area where hens can go outside to get more exercise and sun. Across Europe, home to some of the largest egg producers in the world, animal protection groups have secured over 1,000 cage-free policies and of course the number is ever increasing. With the EU reporting in 2017 that Nearly 50% of hens across Europe now reside in cage-free systems. There are over 90 global corporations that have policies that cover their global locations, such, as com such companies are including Nestle, Unilever, PepsiCo, and so on. Working with Animal Rights Center and other regional groups, we have secured over 100 cage-free policies in Japan. The companies include Nestle Japan, Hilton Hotels, Best Western Hotels, Ako Hotels, and so on. Hilton Hotel also has a policy in Japan, and their timeline is also 2025. In the case-free advocacy, uh, advocacy work, there are challenges, and these challenges may be common in Asia. When asking corporations to go cage-free, insufficient cage-free egg supply, low awareness, limited experts in the field, and there are not there are no standards for cage-free eggs or overarching egg production standard. Although recently Thai government created the standards for egg production. There are the business culture of Japan that are challenging uh, to our cage-free work. Japanese business culture is high risk avoiding, so before implementing a cage-free policy, they will spend time and efforts to eliminate any risks, risks of using cage-free eggs. Decisions are made in groups, so this group mindness also extends to corporations um, they say that the one company cannot make change as it, it, it will interfere other companies in the same industry. When making a change, the whole industry should talk and make the changes together. Even if the challenge bring, ch change brings positive consequences, the change itself is not always a good thing. People tend to be very prideful of what they do, so businesses do not like to be told what to do. When they make changes, it's best they voluntarily do so. So we've, we sort of manipulate the situation when it comes to a cage-free policy. We will make sure to make it look that the cage-free policy is installed because corporations are progressive and they care about hands, people, and environment. It is true that these challenges are making our corporate work hard, but there are ways to deal with it. When going to corporate meetings, we address the plight of layer hands, which will move them emotionally, but that's not sufficient. So we need to be well equipped with the logical and appropriate knowledge and information that will help corporations see the benefits of going cage-free. Corporations can't imagine the success of the cage-free policy, so we should show successful business examples to them and show the roadmap to the success. Let them know that there is a global trend, so if Japan does not move fast, we will be left behind. We tell them that Japan should be the leader of the movement, which they like to hear, in order to bring the cage-free issue as the mainstream social issue, our work should be inclusive. One thing that the TH of Japan does in Japan is working with cage-free farmers who support our work and connect them with our target corporations. Corporations usually don't know how going cage-free strategically and financially benefits them, but they all agree that the current treatment of layer hands is inhumane and it needs to be addressed. This is where I see the opportunity that will sprout and flourish. We focus on that so that the opportunity expands to something more solid, making a cage-free policy. 
By showing a roadmap and connecting them with cage-free producers, corporations can see the path forward. If they can't see it, and they would do it, but if they don't have tools or can't see the future, they won't move forward. By them determining that they will do it, then the changes they bring will be very powerful. I believe that people generally would like to be good and do better. This is where I see an opportunity to change. I believe that it is important to bring the layer hand treatment issue to the mainstream discussion. It's a serious issue, therefore all the stakeholders, including consumers, producers, and corporations need to come together to solve the issue. I believe that layer hands are the biggest stakeholders of the issue, and we activists are the ones who represent their voices. Thank you, Mamu, for this brilliant presentation. Our next speaker, Krista Hiddeman, has spent six years as the Vice President of Mercy for Animals Canada. Her work on undercover investigations for slaughterhouses and factory farms helped expose the truth of what happens in these facilities. Krista now consults to animal rights groups. And she's currently doing a doctoral research on the work experiences of animal rights activists in North America. In her presentation, she will take us through a case study of egg welfare work she led in Canada while she was the Vice President of Mercy for Animals from 2013 to 2018. And will be presenting the top 10 learnings along with some suggestions for activists in Asia. Over. Hi, my name is Krista Hidema. I'm the executive director of For the Greater Good. Prior to that, I spent six years as the vice president of Mercy for Animals in Canada, where we did 12 undercover investigations and corresponding animal welfare work. And it is that experience that informs my talk with you here today. And the title of my talk today is Don't Put All Your Eggs in One Basket. I wanted to focus my talk as a case study of the animal welfare work that has been done in Canada. The commitments we received were wide and far reaching. They ranged from an end to gestation crates for pigs by a quasi judicial body called the National Farm Animal Care Council. It included commitments to end veal crates for calves, a very robust dairy commitment by Saputo, the largest dairy producer in Canada, and there were countless restaurant, food service, and grocery commitments for cage-free eggs, both directly as well as from the Retail Council of Canada. In fact, the commitment was so robust that they had agreed to end uh, all forms of caging in favor of cage-free eggs by 2025. Most of these commitments were on the heels of 12 undercover investigations that took place in Canada during that time. I've decided to lay this out as the top 10 learnings from this experience. The first learning is in connection with the media. Undercover investigations and other pressure brought on corporations in order to get them to make animal welfare commitments was in large part empowered by the media. Initially, the media were a very strong partner for us, but that unfortunately led to the wayside. The media became saturated with the types of stories of animal abuse that we were bringing to them. And in fact, I vividly recall the final egg investigation that we did in Canada at a facility called Gray Ridge Farms. The media chose not to cover that at all. So what I would say is the shock and awe value of bringing attention to these matters really did eventually wear off. And the second 
learning, unfortunately, is broken commitments. Every single animal welfare commitment that we were able to secure in writing, including an end to, to gestation crates for pigs, an end to veal crates for baby calves, and an end to caging system for birds, have been completely reneged upon, particularly by one of the most powerful groups in our country, the Retail Council of Canada. In fact, they issued a press release a mere few weeks ago on April the 1st of this year, where they indicated in the clearest of terms that they are abandoning all previously made animal welfare commitments. The third and perhaps most troubling learning is as it relates to egg gag legislation. Prior to the undercover investigations and the animal welfare work, egg gag laws did not ex exist in Canada. The industry, however, saw the writing on the wall and became frustrated by the welfare commitments that they were making and knowing the costs that it would include. As such, they started to shut down investigations and they started to bring charges for trespassing and for other activities such as open rescue. Through conversations with various lawyers in Canada, all have come to the conclusion that the egg gag legislation that has very recently been passed in the provinces of Ontario and Alberta really come on the heels of the welfare work that had been taking place. The fourth learning is what I'm calling humane washing. There was significant advertising done by restaurateurs and food service companies about their commitments to cage-free eggs, and it created the illusion that the eggs that, that consumers were buying were coming from happy hens, and we know that that is not the case. There was an excellent video about this created by Farm Forward. I would encourage everybody to go and look at that video. Farm Forward calls it the dirt on humane washing, and I've included the URL for that video here. The fifth learning from my egg welfare work in Canada, unfortunately, is that egg consumption has actually increased. Between the years of 2010 and 2018, egg consumption has actually increased by 29.2%. The sixth learning is what I'm calling predictive benefits. Many animal welfare organizations believed that by implementing cage-free egg policies, it would increase the cost of eggs, and as such, consumer consumption rates would go down. In Canada, unfortunately, the opposite has occurred. The move towards cage-free eggs has actually decreased the price of eggs in Canada. The seventh learning has to do with the welfare of the birds. In cage-free systems, the birds may not actually have higher welfare than they might have in an enriched caging system. Welfare in certain situations can actually be worse in cage-free systems. Birds can suffer from things like bumblefoot, they can engage in pecking one another and even cannibalism, there can be higher rates of smothering and even higher rates of certain bone breakage. When we talk about cage-free, it is not necessarily cruelty-free, particularly when additional measure measures, such as considering stocking density and better breeds, have not been considered. The eighth learning that we have seen in Canada has been in connection with our supply chain. We know that it takes both time and money to convert barns from cages to cage free. What it means is that new barns are being built while existing barns are still existing. As such, we have seen the total number of birds in egg production increase dramatically. In January of 2012, according to Statistics Canada, there were over 27 million birds being used for their eggs. 
And in January 2021, that has increased dramatically to over 34 million birds being used for egg production. Moving on to the ninth learning. Ten years ago, we simply did not have the number of plant-based foods that we have today. Today, we know that we can get virtually anything, whether at a grocery store or a restaurant, that is plant-based. As such, when this welfare work began 10 years ago and these options were not there, we believed that welfare work was the only option. Today, we simply know that isn't true. The options are endless, and I believe it's time that we focus our work on diet change, particularly given how easy and delicious a plant-based diet is. And the tenth reason. We understand funding. It is a struggle for all of us that are activists. We also know that the majority of the major funding in our movement has been dedicated to welfare work. That does not mean, however, that that's where we need to continue. It is up to us to show donors the work that we want to do, not just simply appeal to the existing paradigm. There is an availability of funding that does not necessarily need to be tied to welfare. It's up to us to educate funders. It is our job to take our vision and our knowledge to funders. Remember that you are the experts in your region, so teach the funders what you believe are going to make the greatest change for animals. And when we look at Asian countries, you are home to 24% of the human population, a truly staggering number. The Indian census, in fact, also shares that about 25% of their population identify as vegetarian. And while I do think it is important to look at trends in advocacy from other countries like Canada, like the United States and elsewhere, it's more important that the strategies that are adopted in Asian countries are appropriate to your culture, are led by your people, and are not based exclusively on what has or has not worked in North America. It is time for us to understand that we must diversify our activism. It is about the overall expenditure of time, energy, and money in our advocacy. Welfare can play a part, but it has been playing the biggest part at the detriment of other work. And we simply don't know what kind of success we could have had with diet change if the millions of dollars that have been spent on welfare would have been spent on diet change. And most importantly, we must be reflexive. It is critical that we constantly re-examine our work to determine if it is actually helping animals. And just because something was a reasonable strategy at the time doesn't mean that we keep doing it. COVID-19 presents an unprecedented opportunity to advocate for diet change. It is time for us to pivot and to make sure that what we are doing is serving animals. Trends and strategies must evolve, they must change, and they must be based on local culture, food systems, government, and legal systems. Finally, thank you for this 10 minutes. I look forward to the Q&A. Please know that all of the information I have talked about, I have citations for. I'm happy to share them with anyone that might be interested. There are a number of ways that you can reach out to me via my website, my email address. Please follow my blog, and I look forward again to ongoing discussions. Thank you, Krista for these wonderful learnings that you just presented. Moving forward, we have with us Dr. Joe Anderson, who is presently the research director at Phonomatics, as well as co-leader of RECAP, which is Research to End Consumption of Animal Products, Research Collective, and adjunct research professor at Calvin University, Ottawa, Canada. 
Luke has a PhD in social psychology from the University of Waterloo and completed a two-year postdoctoral fellowship at Cornell University. Her presentation will describe key themes from 15 research interviews with Chinese farmed animal advocates about their experiences and perceptions of advocacy in China and also includes recommendations for advocates and international supporters. Over to you. Hi there, my name is Joe Anderson and I'm the research director at Faunalytics. I'm happy to be here today to talk about some research that we've done with the goal of supporting farmed animal advocacy in China. I also want to acknowledge our gratitude to Jia Ying Chung, a consultant with the Good Growth Company for her support with the qualitative research that we've done today. So first, just a really quick recap of Faunalytics in case you haven't heard of us before. We are an organization based in North America that is dedicated to helping animal advocates be more effective in the work that they do. And we have three main programs. The first of which, if you come to our site, you'll see uh, probably the most prominently is our research library, where we summarize academic articles and other research for the use of animal advocates with clear takeaways. The second part of what we do is our original research program, which is the research director I am the lead on. And that includes the study today, as well as others intended to help animal advocates be more effective. And finally, we offer pro bono support to animal advocates uh, to help them design their own research, think about their impact and other types of research questions. So the work that we're talking about today is, as I mentioned, about farmed animal advocacy in China. And I want to start by briefly touching on the reasons for pursuing this work. The first is quite simply the scale. Because China is such a large country and the middle class is growing, the economy is growing, the consumption and production of animal products are already quite high and increasing every day, putting China near the top on a global scale of animal impact. So that's why this topic and this region, but where Faunalytics gets involved is that we put a lot of emphasis on capacity building for animal advocates. And part of that in a situation like this, where everyone needs foundational information about a country, a situation, we want to do some of the redundancy that naturally occurs when each group is scoping the landscape for their own purposes. So we hope to encourage knowledge sharing between Chinese advocates and also to encourage the sharing of that knowledge with Western and international advocacy groups who have an interest in the area hopefully giving some best practices from the perspective of those Chinese advocates. And as it says in the last point here, explicitly addressing their perceptions of how Westerners should and should not be involved in the Chinese advocacy movement. So the research project that I'll be talking about today was qualitative research. So we did 15 semi-structured interviews in English and Mandarin. Uh, with people who identify as promoting veganism or farmed animal protection or welfare in China. And these were semi-structured interviews, which means that they have questions that we follow, but you're able to follow up on any key points to get more information on aspects that you may not have been aware of enough to know to ask the question. In other words, they let you uh, account for the fact that we may not know what we don't know when we go into the project. And what we do with these is turn them into transcripts and conduct a thematic analysis. So systematically going through everything, identifying overlapping themes and similarities and pulling out those themes and generalizations so that we can uh, provide them to animal advocates and funders. So the results I'm talking about today are preliminary. Please take them as such and uh, check back on our website or email me after the presentation if you'd like to get the full report when it's available. 
This is just a quick overview as we are partway through the analysis right now. So there's four main theme topics or categories that we're looking at so far in this data. And again, just remember that these are all based on the perceptions and the comments of the farmed animal advocates who work in China that we spoke to in the project. So we will talk a bit about the current situation in China through the eyes of those advocates, um, their perspectives on international organizations, levers of change that they identify for making change for animals, and directions that we may be able to develop the movement in China. So in terms of the current situation, there are four uh, sub areas here, at least so far in the analysis, we touched on the impact of COVID, both positive and negative, um, lifestyles and values, political views and attitudes toward animals. So just to pull out a couple of key points since we have limited time here today, um, the political views in particular are interesting in that um, there's definitely some curiosity mentioned by advocates. Uh, toward the West and Western perceptions, um, but that the general public doesn't necessarily want to embrace all of those things from the West. Uh, there's a certain degree of suspicion as well, which uh, comes from this perception of uh, potentially Westerners trying to influence China too much, um, which again is part of the reason that we're doing this research. Um, turning to advocates' perspectives on international organizations, they mentioned a few uh, past examples and potential issues going forward, including uh, a few instances when there were failures on the part of organizations to develop a strategy that really uh, was properly localized for China, something obviously to be avoided. Um, instead, what we need is more uh, trust building, partnerships with local groups, um, really an understanding of the Chinese context and working with Chinese advocates on the ground to make sure that if you are going to work in China, uh, that that strategy makes sense and is driven by what Chinese advocates are saying is needed. Um, there's a few other examples here as well of things that advocates mentioned. I won't get into them in any more detail for now, but they will be in the full report. I also mentioned we talked about, about uh, levers of change. And so by that, I mean areas within each of these three sectors, the public, industry, and government, that might be particularly useful, tractable. So just to pull out a few in the public, um, one that was mentioned by advocates, uh, parents may be a good place to start, younger people and the urban and middle class uh, tend to be a little more receptive to messaging about uh, veganism, animal welfare, health, sustainability, all those sorts of things. In terms of industry, one group that was mentioned was farmers who tend to be a little more pragmatic in that if you can make the case for animal welfare increasing profit, that is a potential lever of change. Um, that if you just show them that improving welfare improves profit, um, you can get some farmers on your side potentially. And finally, some advocates mentioned that uh, when working with government, which is a particularly tricky situation in China, um, it's possible to think about uh, animal welfare more in terms of aspects that align with government priorities. So security for the country, economics, health, sustainability as well. Uh, taking those sorts of angles as opposed to the animal welfare angle may be more productive in that those are shared goals that we have with the Chinese government. And finally, we wanted to highlight some directions for development within the Chinese movement. Um, the first within the uh, funding and operations category, I'll give an example of uh, funders not knowing the Chinese landscape well. So providing some assistance in this area, which is what we're starting to try to do with this research, um, helping understand how to, to help um, is really necessary and could be very useful. Under the, the header of kind of capacity building, building ability, um, there's currently a lack of paid jobs and career prospects for people who would like to get involved with animal protection in China. And so helping to identify some of those and make connections, also very important. 
And finally, in terms of building the movement, one example is the idea of developing local leadership. So again, working with advocates who are already working in China, helping uh, those people in leadership positions to become stronger, make more connections, and all of those sorts of networking and movement building ideas. So I could just barely touch on the results of this study in this presentation. I just don't have enough time to go into detail, but the full report will be coming in the next few months. So uh, you can get that at our website, as well as just mentioning this as kind of a bonus. We have another study that will be coming out in the next few months as well, uh, looking at beliefs about chickens and fish in multiple countries, including China and India. So thank you very much for having me today. Uh, my contact information is here on the left. If you have any questions about this research or you just want to be notified when the full report is available, please feel free to contact me. Uh, the general phonolytics information, including our office hours in the middle and Jiaying on the right in case you have an interest in conducting your own user or market research in China or Southeast Asia. Thank you very much for having me and for listening today. Thank you for these wonderful presentations. We have so many points that we can take back with us. Uh, considering the time, being mindful of it, I'll just start our Q&A session because there are many questions that I've just noted down in the chat that I've been receiving. Um, the first one, I think I'll direct it to Krista. Uh, it says, your presentation advocates diet change. And you have also mentioned about the rise of plant-based foods. There are also campaigns targeting signups for going vegan, but how do we know that people are actually undergoing a behavior change? I request you to uh, check and mute yourself. You're on mute right now. Krista, you're on mute. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, I apologize for being on mute. So I think I heard the question being, how do we know if somebody who signs up for a vegan, like a 30 day vegan challenge really goes vegan? I, you know, I, I suppose the answer, quite frankly, is we don't. Um, we don't actually know if they uh, become vegan, if they stay vegan. Um, and I think that fundamentally, when it comes to any form of activism, we don't actually know the outcome, whether it's, you know, a commitment to cage-free eggs or a commitment to, an, to adopting a vegan lifestyle. And I think that that's one of the reasons it's so fundamental that we diversify our activism. Um, and that diversification is really critical. Hence my, my talk being called, don't put your eggs in one basket, right? So this idea of diversification is, is really fundamental. I think also what I'm trying to convey is, you know, I've been a vegan since the late 1980s when there was literally no options around food other than, you know, sort of that back to basics beans and rice kind of idea which is still delicious, but now the options are so incredibly plentiful that for me, the idea that we commit to helping to introduce people to these foods is what is going to impact longer term change. And these sort of 30 day or 21 day vegans is introducing people to this really new kind of eating, new kind of foods that will have a greater likelihood that they will stick to them. I totally get your point, Krista. Um, so I have a question um, regarding the same topic. So how do I do impact assessment? How do I, sorry? How do I do impact assessment? So if I have to assess the impact of my diet change campaigns, um, what do you suggest? How do we do that? You know, I think there's a number of ways that certain groups are doing a very good job of that. An example of a group that I think is doing a great job is vegan outreach. 
So they have really strong impact campaigns to a program that they call 10 Weeks to Vegan. And I know that there is some 10 Weeks to Vegan work going on in Asian countries. Um, I know the campaign uh, individual in India in particular, who is doing some really important impact assessment work on their 10 weeks to vegan. So I would certainly, you know, look to groups that are doing it currently very successfully, like vegan outreach. Thank you so much, Krista. Um, so the next question, I guess, is from Maho. So it says working on policy changes take a long time and sometimes we are not sure about the outcome of such campaigns. In such cases, how do you suggest we carry on with bringing changes and helping animals? Yeah, that's a good question. So this uh, K-Tree movement is very new to Japan in Japan. Um, so we started in Japan 2017 and of course there are groups bef before us who are advocating for a cage-free uh, cage policies and cage-free, but I think the, um, since 2017, since we came in, I feel it's accelerated. So it's still new, so I can't really tell, I don't. I can see that the cooperation started, so changes started from global corporations, global corporations headquarters poli published policies and that the um, Japanese operations have to change policies. And that actually happening, you know, at the beginning of like a few years into like 2017 and a few years. But now I started seeing Japanese corporations are changing so I'm just, I can't really tell now, but I can feel that momentum is growing. That's uh, what I can tell. And I wanna move forward as much as, you know, we're confident, but I can tell one thing is that the change is a little different. So policies in Western countries or Western culture, 100% K-tree, which may not translate well in Japan or maybe Asian countries, 100% is such a, you know, there literally, there's no, not so many k eggs on the market. So it's 100%, it's so difficult. So we have to adjust the, you know, policies according to the cultural and availabilities of eggs and the cultural context. So um, that's how I adjust it, I think. If, 100% policy is not doable in Japan or any other Asian countries, we have to adjust it maybe, and then see how it goes. If this answers my, the question. Yes, absolutely it does. Thank you so much, Mark. Um There was one question which was about uh, priorities in funding. So I would like to direct that question to Joe. Based on the preliminary research, do you foresee a change in the funding priorities from the perspective of diet change work versus reform work? Interesting question. Um, I'm not sure if I do or not. I totally agree with Krista's point earlier about the importance of diversification in the strategies that we're using. And that's one of the things that I personally advocate for with funders, but the funding landscape uh, tends to change uh, slowly and then potentially at times all at once in a given direction. So I think what we need in this area is more research. Um, you know, speaking as a researcher, of course, I'm going to say that. But I think that it is really important that we continue to look at the impact of these different things. And uh, Funalytics and myself in particular are really trying to look at the conjunction the intersection of different types of advocacy and how they affect one another. Um, because I think it's really important for funders to know, for instance, when people are working on reform campaigns, how that plays into the general public's understanding. Again, like Krista mentioned, our egg, is egg consumption actually going to increase due to things like humane washing or will it decrease as people become more aware of these welfare issues. So trying to understand those connections and leverage them in a positive way for animals is something that we need to put more work into. 
I think. Thank you. I get your point. Um, if I ask the same question uh, to you, Krista, uh, what, according to you, will bring a greater landscape change? Will that be diet change work or reform work? You know, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, you know, I've been doing advocacy full time in North America for 10 years now. And in my early advocacy days, I would have said reform work. Um, but my personal views as a full-time activist have changed very considerably. And I think now when I look to what the outcome of some of the reform work has been, particularly here that I've shown, um, there's no question to me that if, if, if the decision were exclusively mine, while I would still do some reform work, I would much more heavily bring in the diet change work. I don't think that any activist anywhere in our movement can say with certain with certainty what the outcome of their advocacy is going to be. We don't know. And anybody who says they know, I think that, you know, there's some confusion for them and, and they should really, you know, look at that again. But what we know is that diet change work is there was actually, I'm going to answer it a little differently and say, I noticed a hashtag at the beginning video and the hashtag was, I'm just looking over to see, cause I wrote it down called going back to our roots, hashtag going back to our roots. And it was that hashtag in animals for Asia video that really struck me. And I think that that is where we need to be as activists is go back to our roots, go back to talking about leaving animals entirely off our plates. When I saw the increased egg consumption in Canada over the last 10 years, and I saw not only the increased egg consumption, but of course the increased number of hens in any form of caging system, it is extremely concerning to me. There was another study I just read a couple of days ago. I sent a copy to Joe. It was done by the Animal Welfare Institute, AWI. And they're right now looking at an increased level of barn fires in cage-free facilities because the dust level in cage-free facilities is higher than in any form of caged facilities. So there are so many other issues that we don't even know about. Um, I also have some real deep issues with um, the conversion rates. So we know that when we go from a caging barn to a non-caging barn, the, the producers, it costs them an, awfully, an awful lot of money. And what we've seen in Canada is very high barn fire rates that have been connected to the desire by these producers to receive insurance money. So there are so many spin-off issues that we would never have thought of 10 years ago when this welfare work started. So I feel very passionately that we need to be teaching our funders that the work that fundamentally needs to be done is about leaving animals off our plates entirely. Thank you, Krista, for your input and for that wonderful answer. Um, there is another question uh, which is there in the chat box, so I'll just read out this for you. You said that cage free has actually decreased the cost of eggs in Canada. This is very concerning and counterintuitive. What explains this price increase? And then, and thanks for sharing a different perspective and the norm. I am not sure if I agree with you about all the concerns about welfare work, but I um, definitely think we need more diversity in our activism and funding. Uh, sorry, was that was the, was that question directed to me? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, you know, I, 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 first of all, I want to acknowledge that, you know, we, we don't know. You're absolutely right. The individual who wrote that question is absolutely right. Um, one of the things, though, that is deeply concerning is this price issue. And that's, I think, was the initial part of the question. And I think that if we look at things like, for instance, McDonald's, we know that McDonald's uh, worldwide is one of the uh, biggest um, uh, egg buyers again, in the world. 
And what they even put out a press release recently, and I have a link for this if anybody wants it, where they're even seeing because of the commitment that they've made and the work that's being done in this area, they're seeing the price difference to be far less between cage-free and caged eggs. And when that price difference is less, that actually runs afoul of one of the predictive benefits, which was higher prices, lower consumption. And that's not happening. It's certainly not happening in Canada. I, I don't want to overstate my knowledge in other countries like the UK, where there's been a lot of work in this area. I, I, I don't want to say that I know the statistics there because I don't, but we are absolutely seeing that here. The price is coming down. It is not that price gap that the welfareists were hoping for, because the initial thinking was if there's a major price gap that consumers won't buy eggs, but we're not seeing that. We're seeing it going up. We're seeing prices of eggs going down, consumption up, more birds in cages, and more birds just laying hens, period. And I think that in particular, when I started doing this, the research out of Statistics Canada is what really caused deep concern for me. So it's not happening in the way that it had initially been predicted. I hope that was the answer or a, an, an, an acceptable answer or, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I also want to invite Jo for her inputs because she has been mentioned in the chat box. So Jo, over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to chime in here for a moment and mention because uh, just the nature of the, the work that Krista and Maho have done is uh, leading us to talk a lot and consider a lot uh, vegan diet change on the one hand, um, incremental welfare ref reform at the corporate level on the other. And I just think it's really important to mention and engage with the idea of using reduction in diet advocacy as well as almost a combination of those things, incremental change, but at the individual level. I think that's playing a major role right now in the increase in plant-based availability uh, in Western countries. And it is something that I think has a lot of potential for overcoming the barriers that we see when we uh, try to ask people to go vegan. Uh, there tends to be, uh, at least in my experience in the US and Canada, uh, there's quite a strong barrier to that because it is not the norm still. And what Phonolytics has found in the work that we've done um, is that when you compare uh, reduction messaging, the idea of doing as much as you can for animals, leaving animals off the, off your plate at uh, multiple meals, but not, uh, not starting out with that vegan ask um, is actually more effective, will lead to less meat consumed overall than the strong vegan ask or even a vegetarian ask. Um, so it doesn't get you all the way to the, the goal that we have all in one step. It's incremental, um, but it is potentially much more impactful. And I should say, I have not tried this work in Asian countries. So grain of salt as usual with that kind of generalization. But uh, in the study we conducted in Canada, we found that uh, about 60% of people were willing to uh, sign a pledge to try a reduction of animal product consumption, which then led to follow through um, ordering meals that didn't have meat in them, um, as opposed to only about 15% who were willing to try going vegetarian. And so the, the result that we found was that just that increased uptake with the, the reduction ask was very impactful in terms of uh, the behavior that followed it. So I just wanted to throw in a, a nod to the idea of getting people to go as vegan as they can be one step at a time uh, as a middle ground, potentially. And, and Sweda, just to uh, underscore what Joe said, and, and I, I hope that I wasn't giving, I feel, I fear that I may have been giving the impression that I was suggesting that the only message is go vegan. I was not. In fact, I agree with Joe. Absolutely. What I've always believed is this advocacy for just leaving animals off your plates as much as is possible. And that's again, where you do things like these 30, day to ve 30, 30 days of trying vegan, they may not stay vegan after 30 days, but they may incorporate 
more vegan meals within their weekly diets. So I was definitely not saying um, the only form of advocacy is you must go vegan. I absolutely do not believe that at all. I believe in incremental steps as Joe was suggesting. Those were your valuable inputs from Joe and Krista. Thank you. Uh, there is one more question. Um, so I would direct this to Maho. Even within policy changes, how do we set realistic goals given our foundation, dominantly speciesist society, and a very strong economy that profits off the animal bodies and consumerism? Yeah, thank you for the question. And this is really a um, good question. Um, that's true that we have to set the realistic goal. That's the key. Um, what is corporations can do? What is public want is going for? And uh, in addition, are there really available cage-free eggs? They have to be realistic. If we go to corporations and, and ask them, first of all, when I go to a corporations in a first meeting, they usually ask, oh, tell us about farm animal welfare. What is it? Why cage free? Where are uh, eggs are coming from? From there, be realistic that I assume they really don't know. Uh, so first of all, we have to bring everybody to the certain point where farm animal welfare is understood what's going on with uh, egg production now and be realistic. So first of all, educate them. But at the same time, um, we need to install policies. The policies has to be something they can do. They can achieve, they can feel confident. If I say go 100% cage free, it won't be, they, they'll take, they won't take us seriously. So realistic goal is what can corporations do? What is available? What is public? going for that's the that's the always i am paying attention to where the common ground right now and what we can bring from there thank you Mahu. um next question uh is for joe so uh this was a question regarding your pro bono work that you're doing to support activists individual activists uh, from your experience and knowledge, what kind of research capacity building programs can be done since research is an area which seems to be lacking in Southeast Asia? Yes, I totally agree. Um, I think that the type of research that we've done here, qualitative scoping research, where you go in with uh, no assumption of what you're going to find is a really important starting place for issues like this. Uh, it would be better to be done by uh, local researchers if they have the means and capacity to do it. Um, and it essentially entails just doing interviews with, with people who are working in the area, getting a good understanding of what they see as the opportunities for capacity building. Um, in our case, uh, due to our position as a research organization, it is nice that we are able to share that research more broadly with other groups. And I would also encourage that, if at all possible, uh, to groups doing work in Southeast Asia, uh, that anything that is learned be shared, even if it's just you know a matter of emailing uh, around or emailing the fast listserv or something like that. Uh, because one of the biggest capacity building issues that I've observed is just a lack of knowledge sharing communication. Uh, a number of participants that I spoke to as part of the study mentioned, for instance, that they had had similar interviews with individual groups who were thinking about working in China. And while it's great that those groups are doing that work to find out what they need to know before hitting the ground, it would be that much more useful if uh, that was shared so that the same people didn't have to have these conversations uh, over and over again, and everyone could learn and build on what we know from each other. So I hope that I hope that that starts to answer your question. And uh, for you and for anyone else who has questions about uh, research and capacity building and those sorts of things, um, I will just say again that that Phonolytics is very willing and, and happy to help if we can answer any questions for you or, or help you out in some way. 
Thank you, Joe. We'll definitely reach out to Connor with this. Uh, so there's just one minute left. Uh, so I'll quickly uh, ask the question, Marvel. Uh, how do you remain optimistic about working for the welfare of cage birds when you do know that ultimately these animals do not get liberated from their cycle of suffering within the factory farm? Shweta, is that the question for me? Okay. Uh, how do I stay opti op optimistic? Um, yeah, this is something... I'm usually a, a, my nature, optimistic person that helps. But at the same time, when I go to corporations who don't know much about cage-free or farm animal warfare, the, 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 when I, we share about you know, the plight of layer hands, they all agree that, oh, this is not good. We have to change. And that's where I see that the people have compassion and the compassion can be expanded. Um, that's that's my uh, hope, actually. Anywhere I go, even producers, yeah, we want to change, but you know, we don't know how, or we can't. But they definitely recognize this is not okay. So that's where I focus, and I, that that's where I try to expand. That's the hope, actually. Thank you, Maho. And I believe that in all our individual approaches, that is exactly the kind of belief that we have. That everyone has that kind of compassion in their heart. And through our small acts, they will uh, change. They will bring uh, considerable human behavior change. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for the lovely presentations and this wonderful uh, panel discussion that we have had today. Uh, thank you for being here, for taking up time. And I wish you all a good day ahead and be safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veta. It was so wonderful much. to have you as a moderator. And uh, we are very, very uh, uh, delighted to receive all those fantastic inputs from our uh, esteemed speakers, Maho, Krista, and Joe. And I think one thing that we are taking away is um, what Maho just said is uh, compassion as hope. I think that is uh, a huge takeaway. And uh, we uh, base our work on that on that crux so thank you once again and uh, stay safe and uh, stay healthy keep smiling and continue the great work that you always do goodbye for now